Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Xamarin University and to our guest lecture series. Uh, this morning, we have James Montemagno, who is a developer evangelist with Xamarin. So his job is to go around and speak about Xamarin at, at conferences and develop, developer groups and companies and um, just kind of share the Xamarin love. And he's a great guy that knows a ton of stuff about Xamarin. So we're really excited to have him here this morning to talk about iBeacons. So James, how's it going this morning? It's going fantastic. I'm here in bright, sunshiny Seattle, Washington, finally home uh, for a few days before we head off to London. But yeah, it's fantastic to be here uh, and being part of the guest lecture series. Sweet. Well, we're excited. So tell us all we need to know about iBeacons. Sure. So we're going to cover actually a few different segments of kind of Bluetooth technology. We're going to talk about what iBeacons are, how do they work, why you should care about them, what you can do with them. We'll go through some code, how easy they are to set up and start actually using in iOS and Android. And then we're going to talk about a new technology and a new product from Estimote specifically, uh, which I'm really excited about. This speech, you know, this talk isn't sponsored by Estimate at all, but it happens to be their product and their SDK. So it's really exciting. Uh, these new stickers are really small Bluetooth devices that can turn any device or any object, I should say, into a location-aware uh, device, which is very cool, and I'll show you a great example of that as well. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Uh, first and foremost, a lot of people ask me, what is an iBeacon? Why should I care about an e iBeacon? And, uh, and what are they? So, well, Apple would classify them in their fancy language as a new class of low-powered, low-cost transmitters that can notify iOS devices of their presence. There's a very fancy way, in general, of saying that these are specific devices. An iBeacon is a device that can notify apps of exact device proximity and location awareness that technically it really hasn't been possible before. When you think about it, we have these devices such as, you know, iPhones and Android devices, and they have a approximate location. They have a GPS location based on Wi-Fi sometimes or GPS signals. Uh, but in general, as far as I am literally or honestly like 0.1 meter away or one meter away from this device has, has really been hard to triangulate before. So that's what an iBeacon is. It's a physical device. Now, as far as developers, and what we care about is actually two things. We care about these devices themselves, the iBeacon devices, and each iBeacon device actually has to go through a certification process with Apple. Most of them do, at least, uh, just because they own the spec for what iBeacons are. And then what we really care about is the API. Now, this API is uh, available on multiple platforms that we'll talk about today. But this API is what we add to our existing or new applications that are enabling us to detect these devices and then do something. So the device is just sitting there. The API allows us to detect it, get information about the, the device, uh, and then in our application, perform some logic to do something with it. So that's really important for what you need to know about iBeacons in general. Now, there's a lot of d devices out there today that you can actually use and, and turn into an iBeacon. Any iOS 7 device, uh, actually, uh, you can tap into core Bluetooth and actually enable it and, and actually start um, developing with it. So you can actually say that this iPhone is going to be a virtual beacon, we like to call them. You wouldn't probably go around a, a store and actually place a bunch of iPhones. That would be very costly. But if you want to do some testing, you can download different applications or write your own application in just a few lines of code to turn your actual iOS device into an iBeacon. Uh, and the API to do this is actually built right into core Bluetooth. I have an example that you'll see in the, the, the show notes, we'll call them. Uh, the lecture notes uh, of how to do this in about four lines of code, just to turn on, and, and it's made specifically just for iBeacons. Now, more realistically, you're going to use these little kind of cute devices that you buy. So there's tons of different vendors out there for iBeacons themselves. Apple themselves don't make or actually produce any iBeacons. They just serve up the API and then obviously create the iOS devices. But there's tons of different. There's, there's so many. I was building a new application, and, and I, I was going through the entire vendor list, and I must have pulled down like 20 or 30 different vendors that I could just find on the Internet. But there's tons of them. Some of them are more uh, com consumer facing that we would purchase as developers, such as uh, Estimode or Radius or Roximity or Onyx. 
And there's a lot of other specialty ones as well that are going in and, and doing specific things uh, for shopping centers or for um, amusement parks or for ballparks or something like that. But this is what you're going to buy, and they range in price anywhere from $5 to $30 a piece. It just depends on the type of device uh, and the type of battery, things like that. Some are USB powered, some are battery powered, some are rechargeable. It just all depends. So there's lots of different vendors out there. So in general, how they work, and what's really important that you need to know about is that they're based off of Bluetooth smart technology, which is the low energy. It's used for all communications. This is really important because traditional Bluetooth uh, or even Wi-Fi, like actively scanning on Wi-Fi or actively scanning on Bluetooth, can be very costly to the battery of your phone that you're using. Additionally, putting a full Bluetooth antenna into the physical device also has implications on the battery. Now, Bluetooth Smart and uh, Bluetooth Low Energy in general uh, is set at a lower frequency, a lower, lower data transmission, that can be brought across the board, but also brings down the power consumption dramatically, almost about like a hundredfold. It's really crazy. Uh, so that's what they're based off of. And, and the reason that they're able to uh, actually use Bluetooth Low Energy is because they're not transmitting a lot of data. They're not doing voice. They're not trying to transmit images across the wire. Uh, and you might, you might say, well, James, doesn't you know, uh, Android Wear and Apple Watch use Bluetooth, but their battery life's only a day? Well, the problem with that is that they have active screens. They're actually transmitting images and data and payloads across the wire, and they're actually doing a lot of computation. An iBeacon itself transmits three pieces of data. It transmits uh, a UUID, which is, is a universal identifier for the device, um, and that is at the, the vendor level or the company level. So you say, this is my UUID for my company. So Xamarin might have their own UUID. Uh, in general. Then the iBeacon then transmits two important numbers to distinguish themselves from all other iBeacons out there, which are a major number and a minor number, which are shorts. It's just a little tiny uh, int 16. And that number, it can be used in any way you want to. Uh, it's, the, it's the identifier for that specific device. It's unique to that device uh, when you combine all these together. So that means if you place that iBeacon in your doorway or you know, near a window, you, you'd be able to then detect that iBeacon based on these properties. So a good example here is a store location. The store location maybe has uh, three different shops, San Francisco, Paris, and London. Now we see the UUID is actually the same throughout the entire, uh, the entire company. And then our major number, one, two, or three in this grid, is specific to each location. Now, the actual department, though, clothing, housewares, or automotive, they're still the same number, 10, 20, or 30, because uh, our application then could use these 10, 20, or 30 numbers to actually investigate uh, clothing, housewares, or automotive specifically. But based on the major number, we would know exactly which location we're in, which is very cool. Important things to know what they're not. iBeacons are not um, a device to use really to track users at all. They don't really know anything about their location. They honestly are placed, and the iBeacon has no context of where it's at. It just, I'm here, and it's just broadcasting over and over again. They don't send push notifications to receivers or devices. There's no really two-way communication between the devices. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the APIs that do enable this. But in general, the idea is that there is no two-way communication because that's costly. Actually, transmitting data back and forth and actually having to send back and forth is extremely costly. So you want to keep the actual battery long, anywhere between one to two to three years of these devices, uh, so that way you can place and forget them. So like I said, they're literally just sitting there alerting anyone that they exist. And each device can be programmed uh, for different uh, ranges, so you can say I would like this to be, you know, up to 50 meter range, or I would like it to be, um, you know, broadcast every 500 milliseconds or every 10 milliseconds, and all of these different broadcast levels of the devices will determine their battery life. But it's very important to know that they do not, you know, send any information, or they don't have two-way communication back and forth, and they don't track any users. Your application is doing all of the processing based on these three pieces of data. 
So the API, uh, the API couldn't be any easier for iOS and Android, and there's a lot of ways to actually do it. In iOS, it's actually built right in. I'm going to show actually how to use core location built directly into iOS uh, since iOS 7 and enhanced in iOS 8. And there's other SDKs out there that you can use. Different vendors are adding different special pieces, pieces of functionality to get rid of some of the tedious work uh, or enhance some of the APIs built into core location. From my knowledge, I don't have a deep investigation of the actual code in the SDKs, but they're just using the same core location code under the hood and they're just wrapping it for you. Now, this allows them to do specific things though. So for instance, Estimote in their SDK actually has an API to connect to the actual iBeacon Estimote device uh, and then actually transmit a few additional pieces of information such as a temperature or the actual, if it's in motion, because uh, there's some additional sensors in the Estimote iBeacon itself. So in addition to the iBeacon uh, three pieces of data, you can actually connect to it and get some additional information that are there or it allows you to connect to it and actually update the firmware of the device. The same thing with Beacon, they have special things in their SDK. But in general, the API can be found just straight in core location. And in each of, in each, in any of these SDKs that you use, iBeacons have the simple premise, same with near, um, stickers that we'll talk about later, of a region monitoring and ranging. So these are the two important concepts of iBeacons. Uh, like I said, remember, they're transmitting three pieces of data, UUID, major, and minor number. And then the actual API is doing the rest of the heavy lifting. So region monitoring first enables you uh, to get notifications uh, when you enter or exit a region. And a region, if we go back to the previous slide here, a region is specified in one of three ways. Simply only the UUID, like when I detect a, an actual any beacon with this actual UUID, or a UUID and a major number, or a UUID, a major and a minor number. So that is a region. So this works if the phone's locked, if it's in the background, if it's killed, doesn't matter. Uh, it actually allows you to pop up notifications if you, your users have given you permission, and then you can actually dive into the application. But you'll get an active notification if you subscribe for region entering and exit events. So that's really cool because you can say, oh, someone has entered my shop, someone's entered home, someone has, has left the shop, and you can track that information inside of your application or register it with maybe your server and have a loyalty program whenever they enter your store, for instance. Now, most likely, uh, you'll use uh, region, mo region monitoring. And region monitoring is active beacon scanning. So this works in the foreground when you actually uh, have your application open and you're actively scanning for beacons over and over again. So this will find all beacons with specific properties. Like I said, a, you specify a region again, so a UUID with or without a major or minor number. Uh, and then you get a list of all beacons. In addition to this, the API is going to return uh, some important information. It will actually return a, a simple enum that is kind of a, a proximity and this is usually what you'll use to determine how close somebody is to their actual to the actual beacon. And this will be immediate, which is you're basically held it held the device up to the beacon, near, far, or unknown. Like it just doesn't know. In addition to this, there is also a rough uh, another variable that we'll look at, which is called accuracy, which is actually the complete wrong name for that uh, that that variable because uh, accuracy isn't actually the accuracy at all. It's actually uh, a rough approximation of how far away the iBeacon is from the device in meters. So we'll take a look at that and active scanning. But this is where you're actually going to do the region monitoring to actually detect any of the beacons while your application is open. So with those simple concepts in place, there's a lot of things uh, that, that you can do with them. Uh, in general, when we're talking about beacons, uh, there's, you have the beacons, but you also need to actually run your app specifically on a device to detect them. Luckily, if you're building iOS or Android devices or apps with Xamarin, uh, any of those applications can be iBeacon enabled. And then any device uh, I, that's running iOS 7 plus can actually uh, detect beacons on, on iOS. And then on Android, uh, as long as they have Bluetooth low energy, 
and Android 4.3, uh, they can actually detect beacons as well. There's not really an API out there for Windows Phone or Windows 8 that I'm aware of, maybe with Windows 10 and Windows Phone 10. Uh, the, a lot of these devices do have Bluetooth low energy, but as far as I know at this time from researching, there's not really an API for those devices. Again, so we can use these devices, these phones, these apps to get this information. And then in that instance, we can get no locations when we enter and leave a house, for instance. Uh, another great example is when you're in a stadium. Actually, MLB has rolled this out in multiple stadiums around the United States to give loyalty information, such as you're in this section, you can get a discount on a hot dog, or actually tracking people of how, how close or how far away the closest restroom is, or how close you know the, this, uh, this food court area is, or where's the closest beer or, or wine garden, or you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, because you're giving context to where the user is currently. So it's actually rolled this out in tons of different places all over the, the states and all over the world, which is a really cool example and use case. So as long as you have the MLB app and you're actually in the stadium is when you get notified. A great use case, of course, is in consumers uh, and, and commercial shops uh, for loyalty programs. You've entered the store so many times, or as you exit, they thank you for coming, or you get like a discount off a specific amount of shoes or, or some other product in the store. And that's a great way of doing it, or just have a loyalty program in general. We actually use them at Evolve in a different way. I built a, the Xamarin Evolve Quest application, which is completely open source on our GitHub, at github.com slash Xamarin slash Evolve Quest. Now, this application is available on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. And it actually enabled you to use, uh, we actually took iBeacons and scattered them all over uh, Xamarin Evolve. And you would go around, you get a, an image and a clue as to where the actual uh, beacon was located. And when you got there, you're actually able to, you got a question uh, or a trivia question or something that you'd have to do, uh, and a little challenge, if you will, to complete the quest. And when you completed the quest, you got a Xamarin Evolve 2014 monkey, which is really cool. So that's just another use case for the different types of beacon um, or what you can do with a beacon specifically. So scavenger hunts, commercial stores, and who knows, there's tons of possibilities, which is why I love talking about it so much, because there's, there's so many different things that you could possibly do with them. So let's take a look at some code. I'm gonna boot up Xamarin Studio here. Uh, so, so I'm gonna go ahead and boot up Xamarin Studio. Now, uh, you're gonna see my face a few times, uh, back and forth, so I do have to pull up the webcam, because I want you to get some context as far as what I'm doing with the physical uh, iPhone that'll be uh, screen mirrored here on your on your on the on the the lecture, and then the actual uh, Estimote device that I have. So I'm using Estimote. It could be any beacon. I should say that any of the SDKs can find any any beacon specifically because uh, you actually have to specify that UUID number. So I'm going to open up a project and we're going to write a little bit of code to actually step through, and then we'll take a look at this here. All right, so there's a few important uh, steps of actually setting up your project. So I've just simply created a brand new iOS project in my application, or inside of Xamarin Studio here. And the very first thing that you wanna do is actually set up your uh, location settings. In iOS 8, they enforce that you actually um, notify and ask your, your user for location uh, awareness. Now, what's interesting here is that you're not actually detecting the location of the user at all. Like I said, it's not like your, your iPhone is being tracked at all. However, since the API for iBeacons in general in iOS is inside of core location, they require that you request authorization uh, and there's two different um, things that you have to do. First and foremost, we'll go into our info P list. This is where all of your different settings for your application are. And if you go into source here, uh, you'll see that I've actually specified this very important, super long uh, property, which is NS location when in use usage description. Now, this here is a physical string. It's required uh, for, for the text that will display when a notification pops up for the very first time you use the API. 
So I'll say I'm scanning for some beacons. You might want to give some more context that we're using, you know, your location, you know, to scan for beacons and give you discounts, blah, 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 blah. You can always add a new property here. And when you drop down from this list, you'll actually see uh, these two down here. So you'll see NS location when in use. That's if you only want to scan for beacons when your application is in use, so when it's actually active, we'll change this over to NS location always usage description, and that is the flag that will enable you to actively scan in the background when your application is not open. So for doing the region monitoring to and from when you get into a location, uh, that's when you'll actually that's the flag you want to set. Additionally, these flags are for any of the core location APIs. So if you're using maps, for instance, you'll want to actually always set this NS location when in use usage description if you want to actually put the location, if you actually ask the Apple Maps to put a dot on uh, for the location of the user. So that's important to know as well. It's not just for beacons. So next, let's go ahead and get rid of this here. So I'm just going to build out a very simple screen here. Now, if we take a look at the storyboard, You'll see it's very simple. It just has a few labels on it, so let's let this spin up here. So the idea for this simple application before we actually take a look at more complex use cases is that I want to be able to detect some beacons, uh, and then I just want to display some few properties of it, and then we'll kind of expand that out. So we'll get this spin up here. There we go. So I just have some labels. They're very, I put them with a, a black background, white text, because uh, we're going to change the background uh, in, in the future here, background color. Uh, so this is it, very simple. I just have a few labels on here and a few, um, and then later we'll go on to the navigation to give some context here. So the first thing that we're going to do is let's just go ahead and, and actually try to call the API and use it. So there's maybe like, 10 lines of code that you actually have to write to actually start beacon ranging and monitoring. I actually simply, I love the API when it comes uh, to Xamarin just because we can use our events and our, our link and everything like that to really make a beautiful request out for getting uh, beacons. Now again, this is built right into core location. I haven't added anything. We can see over in our, our components over here and resources. I haven't added anything specific to components. I actually don't need this. That should be removed. Don't need that. To prove that, there's actually nothing in there specific uh, except for Xamarin.iOS. There we go. I think I had added a component earlier. So let's see here. So I want to go over what I'm setting up. The first thing is I'm going to need a location manager from core location. We can see I have CL here, and we can see I'm using core location there. It's the only uh, thing that you'll have to really bring in for this. Now. In iOS, everything is specified as an NS UUID, and that is specific to the API that you'll have to pass in. Uh, but in general, that's going to link up with this other UUID string that I've specified. Now, this could come from a server somewhere, or it could be you know, specific to your company. This here, this specific UUID is specific to estimates. So I'm using estimates that are here uh, that I purchased. And uh, so every different beacon vendor specifies a different UUID. Some of them allow you to change them, some of them don't, so you want to look into that, SMO does. Uh, but I just leave the default here, which is nice and nifty for me to find later. Uh, and then I'm going to set up a beacon, a core location beacon region. And that beacon region uh, I'll be using to actually specify different major or minor numbers. But the first thing we're going to do is let's just see how many beacons are inside my house. And we'll see uh, how far, and they're scattered all over the place, so we'll check it out. So I'm going to do this in my view did load, but what's interesting here is it's not actually, uh, it, you don't have to be in a view controller, and I and Android, you don't have to be in an activity. This is just a simple API that you could use from any code. I'm putting it in my view did load uh, just because that's a great place to start, and I know that the view has been initialized fully, and then I can actually start and stop. I did, ideally, you would start ranging and stop ranging beacons whenever your view did appear or your view did disappear. As you're navigating through, you don't need to actively scan uh, for beacons if the actual view isn't present on the screen. We're going to do everything inside the view did load, because why not? OK, so I'm going to create my location manager here. That's the very first thing I do. And then you're going to see a very important line of code. 
and it's actually only exists in iOS 8 or higher. So you'd want to do a, a check around this to see if your device is running iOS 8 or greater. Uh, and if it's not, if it's running 7 or 6, then obviously you don't want to do this call, nor do you want to tap into uh, iBeacons if it's not running 7. So I'd recommend targeting 7 or higher. But this call here links up to what we saw in the info P list, which is request when in use authorization. So this flag here um, will actually pop up the notification which will start allowing you to use the APIs. If you don't set this flag, your application won't crash. It will just silently fail when you start ranging beacons. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up that UUID, which is very simple. I'm just creating a new NS UUID based off the UUID string that I passed in here. And then I'm gonna set up a CL, a core location beacon region, so we can start monitoring it. Now, there's a bunch of different overrides in here, as we can see. So there's three that we care about. The first one is, hey, scan for all beacons with a specific UUID or with a major number or with a minor number. So in this instance, you can specify kind of the level deep that you would like to go when actually specifying proximity. So let's first just start off and actually go ahead and, and actually grab all of the beacons uh, that have the specific UUID. Now, there's one additional uh, argument that gets passed in here, which is this identifier, and this is a beacon ID. And this is dramatically different from a UUID. Don't be confused by these two properties. Uh, the beacon ID isn't actually used at all by your beacon. It's not specified by your beacon. It can be any string that you want it to be. It doesn't matter. The only thing that happens is when you set up a beacon region or a beacon... Uh, and, and start ranging or monitoring for beacons, uh, this will get returned to you in your arguments. So you can actually set up different IDs for different regions and then do different things on them. So that's something that you could do as well. All right, so we have our beacon region and everything that we want to do is actually on our location manager. Uh, and we just do ranging here. So there's did range beacons, there's monitor, Re monitored regions, monitoring fails, did start monitoring regions. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, methods inside of here uh, as well that you can start actually uh, subscribing to. So there's regions. I think region left, region entered. Those are your two main ev events for actually specifying a region when I've entered or left. What we want to do is actually range. So did range beacons. And we'll just go ahead and pass in some sender args. Let's go ahead and get the very verbose ones here. We'll do a little plus equals. There we go. So we can see that our arguments are this core location, region, beacons, ranged, event args. So inside of there are a few things. We actually get the region back that we've specified. So this will actually pair up with the actual region. And then we have a list of beacons, a core location beacon. So if we actually came in here and actually just, so let me see, grab the first one to see what we have here. Uh, we have this accuracy number, which is a double, and that's the number that's not accuracy at all. It's actually how far away it is uh, based on meters. We have a few different other things. Most of these things you're not going to worry about at all. What you're going to worry about is the major number, the minor number. So those are important. Uh, those are NS numbers, uh, and you can grab the, the int 16 off them. Those are the U short. And this is kind of where some of the other APIs, such as the estimate, are kind of nice because it just returns you the U short, so you don't have to actually have to go into the actual NS number. For instance, uh, you get the proximity, which is a core location proximity, and we'll use that in the next example. So that's actually returning uh, if it's near or far away. Uh, and then you have some other things such as RSI, which RSSI, which is like a power level of the beacon as well. So that's what you're getting back, and everything else you don't really have to worry about too much. So let's go ahead and first say uh, label uh, beacon, so that's our main one. We'll say text. I'll simply say we found we'll say e.beacons.length beacons. There we go. So every time we range for beacons, which will be at a specific interval, uh, it's kind of random, to be honest, because the beacons are actually transmitting data back and forth at randomly at different intervals. Uh, but the actual iOS device will pick this up, and it'll actually call, trigger this. 
And the next thing, all you have to do to actually start ranging is say location manager dot start ranging. Start ranging beacons. We pass in the actual region. So we'll pass in our beacon region, and that's it. It's, it's honestly 10 lines of code to actually start ranging and, and, and receiving beacon notifications. So let's go ahead and start debugging this. Important here is that I'm always selecting a physical device to start debugging on. Since we're using, since you know, most people are using a simulator on their physical um, Macs, uh, there's no way for it to actually tie into core location or Bluetooth at all. Uh, so you can't actually um, use your simulators to test your iOS uh, or your iBeacon functionality. So that's very important. So let's do this first. Let's go ahead and build it up, and it'll start. It'll start launching it here on my iOS device. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my QuickTime player. There we go. So now automatically it'll start ranging. It'll start finding, and all, as we can see already, it's found five beacons, six beacons. And the reason that the numbers are going up and down, so every single time it's going out, it's scanning, it's receiving information from Beacon. So it's actually going out, pinging, and waiting a specific amount of time, whatever iOS thinks is, is good. Uh, and then it will actually return that number back to the actual iOS uh, device, the actual app. So we did see it went up to six. How much has must have some farther away that are almost out of, out of region there. I was running this yesterday, and it was going anywhere between one to five back and forth. Uh, but, in general, you'll get a notification, you'll process it, and then you'll go on your merry way. Um, you can always stop re region monitoring as well if you need to. There we go. Now it went down to four, back up to five. So we're actually seeing some things. Let's see actually how quick it is. Uh, so we're going to change a few things. We're going to add a little bit more code in here. And instead of just displaying how many beacons we found, let's display a little bit of information about a specific beacon and how far away it is in general. So I have one beacon next to me, and I've already deciphered and figured out that it's beacon major number and minor number are 107 and 8. So we're going to update our region here. And this is how you can actually narrow down specific beacons. So instead of scanning for all beacons, maybe I only want to scan for a very specific beacon. So we're going to type in our beacon major number, our beacon minor number that's in there. So now, instead of just doing it for the UUID, this will be any, uh, or it'll be only the specific beacon. So now, instead of doing this, let's just go ahead and say e.beacon sub zero, because we know there's only going to be one in there. I could always say if e.beacons equals null, or e.beacons.length uh, equals zero, you can always return, just be a good, good citizen there. So let's just go ahead and say proximity, and we'll just two-string that enum, so we'll see what it's returning. And then we'll do the distance here. So we'll take text, we'll set that equal to e beacons sub zero dot accuracy, and we'll two-string that as well. There we go. So now instead of just returning how many beacons we found, we'll actually uh, get some specific information just about one beacon. So what we're going to do here is you're going to see, hopefully you'll be able to see my face now. So my webcam should be somewhere. Hopefully you guys can see me. And uh, let's see here. There we go. Oh, I'm totally there. Perfect. Cool. So that's me. Um, and what we're going to see here, I'm going to go ahead and pull back up the, the player. So I have the actual I, the actual estimate here in my hand. So this is what the estimate looks like. It has a sticky back, so it actually sticks to stuff. And as I take the eye beacon away, you can actually see the number go up or down. So, so here's the eye beacon, and here's the actual device. And then as I get really close um, here, we can see it's actually I'm immediate. So I'm actually under 0.0. I'm as close as I can possibly be on the device. And then as I start to go farther away with it, you can see that number go up. So I'm still in a near proximity. If I was to chuck it somewhere over in my bedroom, uh, you could actually see it actually go farther away. But you can see almost how near real time this is actually getting. So you'd only have to really hold that beacon up there for just a little bit amount of time. Now what this is nice 
is unlike other technologies that we're doing something like this, such as like NFC, you'd actually have to hold it up, it'd have to be actually actively doing something. In this instance, you could start processing information from meters, meters away, you know, up to 50 to 100 meters away, and just get a, a proximity of that they're in the store, instead of having to actually hold it, make sure the NFC reader's in there, back and forth. So this is pretty cool because we're getting two different numbers that enable us to do uh, process something with. So you might want to start with immediate and then actually go down to the actual accuracy number of how close or far away it is, because like I said, it is an approximation. Uh, normally, I just use the proximity of the near, far, immediate, uh, and then if I want to, I can do some additional processing on it. All right, cool. Let me go ahead and turn off the video here. We'll bring that back in a second. Let's write a little bit more code. So now we could actually take this example a little bit farther. So let's go ahead and bring a little bit more code here. So we're going to use that proximity to do something different. So let's go ahead and do this here. There we go. So now we could actually start to set up like a little game, for instance, here. So uh, what we could do is I, I'll grab the first beacon and I'll, I'll grab the proximity, which I'm going to display in the user interface here. Uh, but what I could do is I could actually instead of displaying the proximity, we'll change the background color of the entire view. So if you're far away, we'll say that getting closer, there we go. If you're near, we'll say almost found it. Of course, set that equal to it. Set it equal to yellow, or if we're immediate, we'll set it to green. We'll say did it. There we go. If it's ever unknown for some reason, which can totally happen, uh, you can always go ahead and remove those as well out of there. But we'll be there. We'll do that there. We can change this to beacon. There we go. So now we're going to actually set up a little bit of a game here, and we'll kind of be a little bit closer. So let's go ahead and run this again, and we'll see what it looks like as I move to and, and far away from it. All right, here we go. So almost found it, getting closer. And now let's see how i uh, turn back on the webcam here. There we go. So almost found it, getting closer to it, and now I'm right on it. You did it. There we go. So, and as I move farther away, it'll actually, you know, update this in real time. So we're kind of setting up a game here. So let's do one last thing. So let's go ahead back into the code. So I'll turn off my webcam. Bring that back in a second. So the last thing we want to do is let's say that I we'll have this little storyboard code here. If we looked at my storyboard, there was a way for me to navigate away. So let's say that uh, what I would like to do is if we'll say if my we'll go into the immediate. So if we're on immediate, we'll say if our beacon dot accuracy is less than point oh five for instance there we're really close what we could do is we could navigate to like a new victory screen so you did it you found you found the beacon you're awesome and in this instance we probably say like location manager dot stop ranging beacon so we'll be a good citizen here we can actually pass in the specific region uh, from that request that came in so now one more time we'll run this actual application But of course, the point here is that while I'm just using it as a little type game, you'd actually could change this and actually do anything you want with it. So we're almost found it. Now if I get really, really close. Oh, maybe that region is blank. Let's go ahead and try this again. Or for some instance that found is not there. Oh, it might not be found. There we go. Cool. Figured out what I named it, and there you go. You win. So in this instance, we've used multiple uh, bits of information. We've scanned for all of our beacons. We've scanned for some specific beacon, and then we actually use the proximity and the accuracy to create a little game.
Now, I'll show you the API to actually do region monitoring as, uh, as well. So here's the code. So if I actually go in here. So if we come back down here, so instead of ranging, again, we're actively ranging, so getting notifications, what I could do here is uh, I could say location manager dot region entered. Additionally, I could say location manager dot region left and actually pass in some args here and we're getting some different things. So here for instance, I could say is far away. So in this instance, this can actually be run on the UI thread, or not on the UI thread, sorry, in the background to pop up no notifications. So it actually pop up a new local notification on the actual device. And if it finds this region, when you're getting close to it, it'll say beacon is close by or it's far away. And this is how you could actually entice people to come back into your application. So there's a few things that we'd have to do here to actually get region monitoring working. So the first thing we're gonna do is come back into our info P list. And we're gonna go ahead and change this uh, to add new custom property, we're going to go ahead and add our NS uh, always usage, scan in, we'll say scanning in the background, there we go, save that there. Now additionally, instead of just calling request win in use authorization, we'll say request always authorization. If you do always authorization, it implies win in use. So that's, that's good to know. Additionally, each vegan region, you can, there's different properties on it that you can set. Uh, for instance, there's obviously the major and minor number. You can specify uh, the different entry state uh, on here. So you can always say like, I always want uh, to be notified. So you can actually turn these on and off for specific regions. So on entry, on exit. I believe the default is true, but we can always just set it here uh, just to be sure. So on exit, on, on exit of the region. And then the last thing we'll want to do is say location manager dot start uh, monitoring. And again, this will take in a beacon region or and a desired accuracy if you want to pass that in, or it'll just be the actual physical region. So we'll actually pass in that same region there for that specific beacon. Now, this one might not show up on it. Uh, we'll see if it'll come back later just because of how um, the actual beacon regions entered or left or whatever. So we'll see if anything pops up on our display uh, as well. So let's see. So this is the notification that you'll get. So we'll see that we already have access for foreground. So it's actually doing stuff in the background. We'll go ahead and allow this. If you hit cancel, if your user said cancel, then you won't get notifications at all inside of your application uh, that things are happening. So you actually want to account for that. A good, uh, good thing that I did inside the Evolve Quest application is I enabled uh, QR code scanning, for instance. So if you didn't have Bluetooth on your device or, uh, for instance, didn't have that put on, uh, then, then you could always do that as well. So let's see here. Um, I will also say one thing that's kind of cool is if you take a look at the bottom left, this is new in iOS 8, is if you actually are scanning in the background and your, note, your application is getting some data back, you'll actually have your app's icon show up on the app screen, and if you swipe into it, it will actually uh, bring it up. Everyone can see my password. Let's go ahead and put that away. For some reason, my Touch ID is never working. But now, for instance, if I enter exit or region, I'll get these notifications. Um, this one's a little bit trickier to demo live just because uh, it doesn't always, doesn't always work because I'm actually not entering or exiting a region. If I go ahead and throw this beacon somewhere, I guess. We'll see if it actually shows up later. We'll, we'll throw it, I'm throwing the beacon into my bedroom. We'll see if that works, uh, see how close it gets. All right, so let's come back to that later, though. Uh, but let's talk about something that I'm super excited about uh, which uh, is uh, the new nearable stuff. So let's take a look at that. So let's go back to the slides here. So there's a few things that I mentioned. Uh, obviously, in, in iBeacons themselves, in iOS 7.1, they actually added uh, different location permissions. 
Uh, and originally, the location permissions would just show up automatically. You didn't actually have to do anything. They added background notifications. Uh, but in iOS 8, they it added the enhanced uh, home screen lock notifications that we saw earlier. Uh, but additionally, uh, they added this opt-in feature, which is never always or when the app is open, which is why we actually have to specify specific information. Let's see here. So there's a, uh, before I go further on this, uh, there's a question here from Raphael. Uh, th this implementation should be done on all platforms, or can I implement something in a PCL? Uh, so I'm implementing it on each platform. Uh, there's no like plug-in architecture. So anyone could write one uh, to do it, for instance, uh, if you abstract away the actual specific ones. Usually each, uh, each SD SDK is for ones for Android, ones for iOS. Uh, however, there's, there's no reason that you couldn't abstract this away to create a common API for each platform. There doesn't happen to be one right now. Cool. So like I said, the iOS 8 gotchas is make sure that you always do request when use authorization. Uh, it's very important. And that you add that information to your info plist. If you don't do that, you won't really be notified of, of what's going on, and it just won't work, and you'll be very frustrated, like I was when I upgraded to iOS 8 originally. So make sure that you do that. Now, for Android development, inside the sample application, you'll find um, a little bit more involved um, samples of actually actively scanning, displaying different bits of information back, um, using just the core location or the Estimo SDK for Android. Inside of this, uh, I call it iBeacons Everywhere. It's on my GitHub. Uh, you'll see I'm using the uh, Estimo SDK for Android and also on Android Wear, because Android Wear devices, the actual watches, have Bluetooth Low Energy built in. You can run code right on the watch. So you can actually actively scan for beacons on the watch, which is very cool. There's some other components. Uh, since Android doesn't have core location, uh, you know, it does have Bluetooth, so some so developers and, and the beacon manufacturers actually create their own SDKs for Android. So again, inside of Android itself, there's no iBeacon API. However, uh, these fine folks at Estimote, Radius, uh, and Alt have actually created libraries, and these are all available on the component store. Cool. So like I said, I'm very excited about uh, Asimote's new product, Stickers, uh, which are taking kind of the concept of iBeacons, but taking it in a different direction and giving us more information to actually play around with. And then the beautiful thing here is that the actual, um, the actual stickers are tiny. So if I actually pull up the webcam here, I think everyone can see me. Let's go ahead and jump out of this and double check. Or everyone's seeing me twice, I'm not sure. There we go. I think, or you're seeing me twice, I'm sorry. But, so this is how tiny an actual sticker is. So it's actually super, super thin. Uh, and it's just the size of like a quarter. So it's maybe like two quarters tall, which is pretty awesome. So I want to give some context there to the actual size of the beacon. There we go, turn that off. Now, what's different about stickers is that they're still a device. And the idea is that the sticker that I just showed you uh, is that you're gonna stick it to some object and turn it into a nearable is what Estimote is branding them as. And, and the idea there is that you can track where those things are at, if they move, it's okay because you're actually in your application doing specific things with that information. It has an ARM MO Cortex uh, built in processor, there's a motion sensor and a temperature sensor as well. So uh, this, this little puppy here actually gets about a year battery life or so. They're a lot cheaper, which is nicer. The Estimotes are about $30 a piece. Uh, these come in a developer kit of 10 for $100, so $10 a piece, which is really cool. Of course, beacons uh, vary as well in different prices. There's still an API. Uh, it's not built into core location. Uh, they have their specific uh, 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 SDK and API, we'll take a look at it. It's very much the same uh, API. Um, it looks exactly the same, but returns different information. What's cool here is that there is no UUID for specific nearables. Nearables have an ID or a sticker type. Uh, there's no major or minor number, so there, it's less information to worry about. Uh, but for instance, you can see on the actual devices here, if we look, there's like a shoe or a bike. They're actually branded with a color and a label, like a type on there, 
So for instance, you might stick the car on a car or a bike on a, a bike, for instance. Uh, or for instance, maybe you're doing tracking of, of, bike, of actual running, um, and you can actually put it inside of a shoe or something like that. The API enables you to range and monitor. So the same API, so ranging and monitoring the different uh, stickers. And additionally, there's a trigger engine, which I'll talk about as well, which enables you to subscribe to different uh, types of rules that you can create uh, that I'll go into, which are very cool. So for instance, maybe you stick this in the flower pot, and then your application you know, monitors like how close you are to it. And then you can say, oh, I watered it this day, and it'll give you a notification later on, for instance, there, which would be kind of cool. Put on your laptop, a good use case for this is maybe you register and have an application that says, did I pack my laptop? Is everything here? Did I you know, put, have one on my power cable, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and then you can actually um, you know, have an application that notifies you to say, yeah, I did pack everything into my bag, for instance. Um, there. So again, everything is based on ranging and monitoring. So the ranging API is going to look very, very similar to what we saw earlier. Uh, instead of creating a location manager, we're going to use the estimate uh, SDK, and it's going to be a nearable manager. The nearable manager then enables us to do ranged nearables. You say that I've ranged some nearables. I return a, a, an, an array of nearable devices instead of, of, of beacons or in there. And then in a view did appear or did disappear and being a good citizen. And you can start ranging. And you can range for a specific ID of a beacon or a specific type. Uh, normally you'll just say all and this will give you all the different types back on there. Additionally you can do region monitoring like we saw earlier uh, inside of there. Uh, and then what we see is instead of doing the start ranging you'll do start monitoring and you can pass in a specific type or a specific identifier for the beacon. So maybe you first actually uh, range for some beacons, you want to do something specific when you're actually to monitor a region. Then you'll get an entered identifier, identifier region. Additionally, you can just specify when did I get close or when did I enter the region of the fridge or the dog or the, or the actual bike, which is kind of cool because these could be moving around. And you get notifications there. So ID or by type. And you get two different events back on those. But what I really liked about this and about SMS that makes me so excited about potential application development is that we get to actually have new properties to play around with. The API will return if the actual sticker is moving. It'll tell us how long it was in a specific motion state for. So for instance, it'll actually tell you like how many seconds it was moving for. So if you actually had this inside of a shoe, for instance, you'd be like, oh, this person was running for X amount of time. You get the orientation of the device. You get an acceleration in the X, Y, and Z coordinates, temperature, the color of the specific device, and the type. So if it was the bike, a car. Now, of course, these are actually just printed on the stickers. There's no reason that you couldn't say the car is something else. It's, it's not, it doesn't actually know that it's a car, for instance. It's just whatever is printed on the sticker, and you can change that on their back end at cloud.estimo.com. So I really like that. Now the trigger system is really advanced. There's multiple triggers, and you can create your own trigger sets, but you can use a proximity rule, uh, which is based on range, so when I'm close to a car or close to the bike, for instance, a motion rule if I'm moving or not, if the, or if the nearable, the sticker is moving or not, uh, get notified when a specific orientation of device is set or temperature, or you can set a date range. So we'll take a look at some of this here. And this is a good example. Um, this is maybe setting a reminder when I leave for work in the morning that I want to be notified, uh, and I, I'm a biker, so instead of it being the car rule, it's, it's my bike rule, I want to make sure whenever I get on my bike between the hours of 6 and 9, when I get close to the bike, and if I happen to leave my bag, so if I get on my bike and I don't have my bag because I have a nearable sticker on my bike and on my bag, I'll get a notification inside of my application when this, this entire trigger happens. So this is really cool because I'm actually building up this big query almost of saying, when do I want to be notified inside of my application when these complex rules happen? So I want to say, you know, between 6 and 9 in the morning, when I get on the bike, let's make sure that I have my bag. And for some reason, if I don't, so even, even if I'm on my bike and I'm riding to work, I might get a notification after I leave my house because I'm out of the region 
that says, hey, you left your bag at home, you know, and your laptop's in there. So you're just building that up. So I create my rules. So it's kind of like a rule engine. Create my three rules. I put them inside of a trigger, which is an array of rules. And then I just actually say, start monitoring for that trigger. And whenever that state changes, true or false, um, I'll get a notification. And I can process it. So let's actually take a look at that. So I want to show some of these rules in action. So let's go ahead and open the numerical sample here. Let's see here we have a few questions. How long will these stickers run? Uh, Estimate says that the stickers themselves will run for about a year. Um, and of course, they can always update the firmware and things like that as well. So that's a question that we have. All right, cool. So this is the actual sample code. Uh, I'm actually going to modify it, and we're going to add some rules inside of here. But when you download the, the component, so here's the estimate. Uh, this is what my sample looks like here. So we go up here to my components. I've added the estimate SDK for iOS. Uh, this is available in our component store. If I go ahead and double click on that, pull it up here. Uh, you get a full getting started guide. It's important that no matter if you're using iBeacons or the actual, if you're using uh, iBeacons or SMOs, you want to ensure that you uh, call the request always authorization flag inside of your application so you get notifications in the background. And here's the code to do that here. Uh, and then the same thing with nearables. Make sure that you're always calling the request authorization as well. But we can see that we give a nice little sample here that you create a nearable manager, and when you range, maybe pop up a UI alert queue. So that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, but you get full samples. So there's an iBeacon sample and a nearable sample. So if you're using the Estimode SDK, uh, you can decide if you want to poke around in there as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, nearables uh, monitoring example here. So in this instance, what we're doing here is I'm creating a nearable manager, and whenever I range a specific nearable, um, I'm actually just ranging for one. When you say ranging, instead of specifying like a region like we did over in um, the iBeacon code earlier, you can range for a specific type, a specific property, or anything you're around. So in this instance, I want to dive in and get information about a very specific nearable. So I'm going to say whenever I ranged a nearable, we actually could come in and say there's range nearable, range nearables. So in since if I'm, I'm doing like all types or just specific one, um, I can actually just do one or the other. Uh, and then, of course, I have my entered identifier region, exited identifier region. And then this is what's really cool is I update the stats. And we see there's all different sorts of stats here, such as firmware state, uh, the battery voltage, if it's moving, the orientation, and different information in here as well. And I just simply stop or start monitoring here. So let's go ahead and pull up this sample that I have here. So we'll go ahead and pull this up. So here's all the different nearables that are actually, uh, that I have. So if I type on one of them, let's see if I can run this again one more time here. Let's pull this up. So I'll build it up here, and then we'll try to run this again. There we go. There's our little notification. And now we'll start to pull in different information. Ideally, I might have a bug in my sample. I'll have to figure out what's going on there. That's strange. Double check that. All right, the sample seems to be crashing, so I'll double check that, and it'll be up on the sample from the component source should work. But uh, let's see. I'll try to figure out what's going on with that. Uh, but let's take a look at the trigger engine in general and see if that will work. Let's see here. Hmm. 
All right. Very strange. It was working just fine for me last night. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look back here at the nearables, though, because uh, one thing that is really cool about this in general, if I just pull it up, even though we get to like before it's crashing, or say, there's getting different information back about that nearable. So we can see that this one is the specific car that's on there. We can see if it's near, far, uh, in the type on here. So we actually are seeing that it's immediate that's on here. So I'm actually going to pull up my, uh, if, I, if I was to pull up the webcam, I'm actually holding the car sticker right up to it. Uh, but all the other ones are farther away. And the distance here, the difference between a sticker and an iBeacon is that the distance that they can actually uh, send information is a lot less. Uh, but it's really nice just to get this type of information to pull it in. Let's take a look at a different sample of the triggers. So I think this is really where we'll be able to pull in some really cool things. So for instance here, uh, inside of this rule, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, I'm going to come into here, and whenever I have a little switch that's available to turn on so I can set up my actual um, pick a specific uh, sticker, like such as bike or car or shoe that I want to put the trigger on, and then when I do that, I'll set up the trigger. So it's actually really simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to say for rule one, let's say whenever it's horizontal, so it's laying flat, that's when I want to get a trigger notification. So for instance, let me go ahead and pull out one here. So let's go ahead and run this again. So there's my quick time. Let's bring up my video. So in general, so I have my, my chair that's here. So we'll go down to chair. I'm going to turn it on. So when I turn on this, uh, when I actually go ahead and actually lay it flat, we can see that the time's been updated. So I say whenever this trigger's been notified, let me update the actual user interface. So whenever this changes, we'll actually update. So that's my first trigger. Now, that doesn't seem like much. What would be cool is that this could be on like, like blocks, for instance. Maybe it's like a ch child's game that you're building out, and then you could actually put that on there. So that gets updated, which is really cool. We can see it's changed again to 22, so that was the last time that it was triggered. Let's actually build out this rule, and let's do something a little bit more complex. So perhaps what I want to do is say var, let's create rule 2, and we'll tie into the motion, motion rule, and we'll say um, equals. So we'll say when the motion state is true or false, so let's say when it's false, so when it stops moving and it's horizontal, uh, let's actually uh, trigger that. So we'll say for this instance, we'll also do a get type for row, row, so whichever one we pick in there. I'm going to say whenever it's been laying flat and it's not moving, let's get a trigger notification. So let's go ahead and pull this up again. Oh, forgot to do one thing. We're going to build up this rule so it's when all of the uh, states are true. So let's go and do rule two. There we go. Let's go ahead and stop building. Really wants to build, so we'll let it build. All right, there we go. So let's build it up one more time now that we're using rule two. And we'll pull it up here. Since I am building up the entire like SMO and I'm changing different things, it's going to take a little bit longer to actually to build up here. So let's go ahead and see what it's doing the device here. So I still have my chair, little sticker here, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then we'll actually go back and we'll let it deploy. There we go. Built all up. There we go. So we'll go back into our trigger demo. 
Now, I'm going to go ahead and pick, this is the chair, so there's a little sticker on there. So we're going to turn this on. And I'm going to just start moving it back and forth. And, and see, when I'm moving it, I'm not getting any notification. But as soon as I stop, and it's in a horizontal movement, automatically get notified. If I start moving it again, or it's in a different orientation, even if I stop, I don't get notified. But as soon as I actually go ahead and rotate it over into a different state, we can see now that it's been updated with a different time there. So we're actually updating it because the events are moving back and forth when I do this. So how could you actually do something a little bit different with this? Let's say I wanted to create a game, maybe a child's game, where these are on building blocks, and I need them to be in a specific orientation. So instead of uh, doing a motion state, because that's a little bit weird, let's do an orientation. And then we can say, I would like this to be vertical or horizontal. So let's say I want one to be horizontal and one to be vertical. So there's my vertical. And in instance, I want the car to be vertical standing upright. So I can pass in a specific identifier or a nearable type. Nearable type. And I'll say this is going to be my car. And we'll build up that trigger there. So now we have two different orientation settings on there as well. So let's build this up. And we'll actually build up this rule as well. Now, you can do several things, such as you could add more rules to say, I don't want any of these to be moving at all. You could say, you know, make sure that the car and the, the bike aren't moving at all, which would be another, another way of doing it. We'll let this application build up. We'll do it. up here, let it finish building, and then we'll deploy. All right, so we'll go back into our orientation demo. I'm going to go ahead and say, the one that I want horizontal will be my chair. So I got both of them here. Now what's really cool is if I leave the chair laying down flat, now when I actually go ahead and rotate the car, now it actually gets updated in real time. So as I'm changing these, now if I notice if I stick them both up in the air, nothing will be changed. But as soon as I lay that one down, I'm automatically getting notified inside my application. We see it actually updates with the timestamp of when that notification came in, which is really cool. So like, I'm not actually detecting or actually have to do very much work. I just set up my trigger system, and it just handles it for me automatically. And I think for some reason the monitoring started working again. There we go. I don't know why I was crashing earlier, but it seems to be working now. Before we finish off and close up with any questions, I did want to show you kind of how this is actually actively monitoring uh, here as well. So this, I've selected the car, and we, as we can see, as I start turning it, I'm actually getting different notifications on the orientation. If I start moving it here, we'll see the moving is true. It doesn't know its orientation. Uh, and then we actually get that it was, if I actually start the motion state, so if I just keep moving it back and forth, watch the motion state up top. If it actually keeps going, it's actually going to keep counting up the seconds that I was in a specific motion, which you can then use specifically for doing something else, such as like how long was I actually running for, doing something else with, and then it'll actually stop here as well. But um, that way you can actually detect how long things were not moving for or moving for in general for a specific motion duration, which is really cool uh, inside of here. So you get all this different information back, including X and Y acceler acceler acceleration down there, so you actually see how things are moving in the X or in the Y and the temperature setting, which is in Celsius here as well. So if for some reason it was getting really hot and it was actually increasing the temperature, you'd actually get notifications on that temperature setting as well, which is really cool. So I just wanted to show you that that was kind of all working there as well, which is pretty awesome. All right. So there's a lot of resources to get you up and starting on it. Uh, Mike did an entire blog series originally on uh, kind of find the monkey with the eye beacon. So there's how to do it on iOS, on Android, and on Google Glass as well. You could obviously also do it on Android Wear as well, which is pretty cool. All the code for this sample for all the eye beacons are at, I, at my GitHub, github.com slash James Montemagnus, and it's eye beacons everywhere. 
the actual Nearable SDK samples, when you download the component, you can actually start playing around with them. You can find out more information about how you can purchase the specific iBeacons and Nearable devices uh, when you go to estimote.com. Uh, and of course, the Evolve Quest is completely open source, so you can actually dive through the entire source code. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask me. Uh, inside an issue, for instance, I monitor that from time to time. But it's an entire scavenger hunt application already up and running uh, for you. All you have to do is plug in a little bit of information, and I'll see if there's any questions. Thanks so much, James, for your time this morning. Absolutely, yeah, and if anyone has any other additional questions, uh, just feel free to ping me on Twitter, at James Montemagno. Or email me james at xamarin.com. It's just that simple. Um, I'd love to stick around for hours uh, to answer more questions, but feel free to email me or ping me on Twitter. And thanks again for having me. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody.